Some of us explore space, even walk the moon. Most of us have access to vast knowledge right at our fingertips and advanced technologies in our homes, offices and cars. Most of us do, but not all of us. I would like you to meet two of my friends. This is Tilahun Abebao. He comes from a small village in southern Ethiopia. A few years ago, he presented me with this spear. And he said that as a kid, he used a spear just like this to hunt antelopes and hyenas. At 18 years of age, Tilahun got his first shoes. Every Monday, he walked 15 kilometers still barefoot to his school, carrying with him the food for the whole week. He slept and worked on a piece of rented floor. Despite all his hardships, Tilahun, in 2009, got a PhD in mathematics in Sweden. And today, he's responsible for postgraduate studies and research at the Department of Mathematics at the University of Addis Abeba. And this is Fangia Rakotandrayo. She's from Antananarivo, Madagascar, and is the first female PhD holder at her country. Her way to success was far from easy and obvious. In spite of being internationally recognized as a brilliant scientist, she was for many years opposed and marginalized by her male colleagues. But she never gave up. She fought hard and stood up not only for herself, but also for other female PhD candidates, which now already are four at her department in Antananarivo. Tilahun and Fangia made it. But I would like to ask you how many other gifted students from developing countries are given a chance to get an appropriate education. Let's have a look at some odds they are up against compared to some of their Western peers. The developing countries are spread across three continents. Out of Africa's 55 countries, almost all are among the poorest in the world. For Many people, it is hard to imagine how huge this continent really is. So let's compare it with some other countries. Here is a map of Africa covered by Japan, China, India, United States, Western and Central Europe. A little bigger than some of you perhaps thought. There are 22,000 officially recognized universities in the world. Out of the top 10,000 universities, 27% are in the United States and 20% in the European Union. Compare this to the whole of Africa, where there is only less than 2% of top universities. And if you only look at the sub-Saharan Africa, the number drops to 0.8%. Given that the population of Africa is about 1.2 billion, it basically means that in the average, Africa has 50 times larger population per university than the United States and 23 times larger than Europe. Obviously, there is a huge need of building up scientific capacity in developing countries in general and in Africa in particular, but this possess enormous challenges from infrastructure to academic staff members. Let me show you some of these challenges. While some universities in developing countries have rather modern campuses, like the one in uh, San Luis, Senegal, most of the campuses are pretty much run down, like in Abidjan, Ivory Coast. Some students have access to relatively modern equipment, like, like in Abuja. Other, or at least decent classrooms, like in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Other have much, much tougher conditions, like in Brazzaville, Congo. In addition to inadequate campuses, there is a huge shortage of academic resources, like libraries, laboratories, and internet connection, which 
even when it exists, is slow and uh, unstable. Without this kind of resources, very little of, ac of academic activities can be conducted. Access to our scientific literature is very limited. Modern academic books are just too expensive. At some point, I gave a course in uh, Nairobi for 50 master students from seven countries. And in this course, I used a textbook published in the United States. I wrote a letter to the publisher asking for a few free copies of this book. And to my great surprise, they did not only offer all 50 copies, but even delivered those books to Nairobi. You should have seen the faces of those students when each one of them got his or her own brand new copy still smelling of printer's ink. For most of them, it was the first time they got a new printed book in their hands. On the other hand, a simple USB memory m can contain thousands of books in PDF format. Such a illegal libraries containing up-to-date scientific books on almost all subjects exist and circulate in developing countries. The problem then is, what is morally most wrong? Distributing these libraries or withholding access to scientific literature from students and teachers having no means to buy it. Another important issue is gender and ethnic equality, which may take decades to solve. In developing countries, the uh, ratio of uh, female scientists is very, very small. In many faculties, there are no single female faculty members. Uh, well, in spite of all the efforts of international community and uh, local governments to address some of these challenges, sometimes it may appear as we are trying to climb a steep hill during a severe mudslide. Let me show you some what what's been tried up until now to address some of these challenges. There are, I will show you three different ways currently applied. The, in 2013, about 300,000 students from Sub-Saharan Africa studied abroad. The traditionally, those students are invited and given full scholarships during their studies. The main drawbacks of these methods are the high cost and a considerable brain drain effect. Many gifted youth never return home. This happens mostly among postgraduate students. Those who return home most often lose access to advanced laboratories, libraries, and scientific environments. So although this method benefits individual students, it has a negative effect on the whole idea of building up scientific ecosystem in developing countries. Another method as develop, uh, for postgraduate students as developed by the International Science Program ISP at Uppsala University is based on university studies at home while visiting supervisors at the host university a few months each year. Although these methods decreases the brain drain effect, the costs are still pretty high. Our focus at in the ISP is on mathematics, physics, and chemistry. And uh, the main goal is building up a sustainable scientific capacity of one university or a network of universities. Uh, usually, this is a long-term commitment of 15 to 20 years until such a scientific environment is well established. Um, supporting those universities with necessary infrastructure, like libraries and laboratories, is always part of the project. The main objective is not to support individual students, but rather universities and countries. By educating a good number of PhD holders, one creates a critical mass of scientists who will be able to conduct further development and research on their own and hopefully educate and inspire new scientists. The third 
method of bringing education to developing countries, a method which I personally strongly believe in and which could, as I see it, achieve even better results, is to create a number of centers of excellence uh, strategically located at developing regions. Each such a center will form kind of local scientific cluster which will serve and interconnect nearby countries. The host country will have a close cooperation with one prestigious university in the West, which will guarantee high level of education and during some initial period of time uh, issue master or PhD certificates. The faculty members will be recruited worldwide. At some point, when such a center gains international recognition, it will be fully turned over to the host country. One of the pioneers in this approach is Stockholm University, which together with the University of Dar es Salaam is currently setting up the Pan-African Center for Mathematics. The plan is to accommodate at least 40 gifted postgraduate students every year from the whole continent. It is though arrogant, patronizing and sometimes very wrong to export our solutions to developing countries. What is more, more important is to teach out the methods of problem solving and let the local scientists and policy makers solve the local problems. They understand their conditions much better than Western scientists in their sterilized environments will ever do. Thanks to all international and local efforts, the noted progress is quite visible in some countries. Some 12 years ago, in Ethiopia, with a population of 75 million, there were only three universities and less than 10 PhD holders in total. Today, the number of higher learning institutions increased to 32 and the number of PhD holders passed 100. Still, those new universities suffer from a lack of well-educated staff members. Now, my personal focus and passion is on mathematics. It is never meant that studying mathematics must lead definitely to become a professional mathematician. What is most important is to educate good problem solvers, since problem solving is fundamentally important in any career. Let me illustrate problem solving with one simple question. Since you all are familiar with the uh, multiplication table, it shouldn't be difficult for you, and I think you will have an answer within less than one second. Look, I have 10 fingers on my hands. How many fingers are there on 10 hands? Obviously, all of you already arrived to the answer, although in my experience, less than 3% of the audience have the right answer, which is 50. Most common and uh, quick and wrong answer is 100. Problem solving is much more than just calculation skills. Solving real-life problems often has similarities to solving mathematical problems. The strategies, solving strategies we use in math are applicable far beyond mathematics itself. So what we do, we teach students to solve mathematical problems while in reality we teach them how to understand and analyze the situation which is the problem to be solved and what variables to act on, what strategies to use in order to find a solution. We give them tools they can also use later on in life. The content is that today you do the math, tomorrow you may change the world. In the best of the worlds, all policy makers and those in power have some problem-solving skills. Let me give you one final example. 
through all Africa, you can see billions of plastic bags drifting in the wind over streets and fields. Besides being a serious littering problem, these bags cause diseases and death among cattle that unfortunately eat them. Innocent Kabenga from Rwanda studied environmental sciences in Sweden and went back in R Rwanda. He was in the position to ban plastic bags from his country, the first such national ban in the world. Today, Rwanda is plastic bags free and is the cleanest country in Africa. Students with mathematical background solve problems of uh, build mathematical models for solving problems of water supply, disease control, agricultural improvement, uh, communication, and so on and so forth. Some became uh, successful engineers, doctors, scientists, and even politicians. But this is only the beginning, and much, much more effort has to be done before the actual need will be met. As Mahatma Gandhi so wisely said, be the change that you want to see in the world. By traveling to a developing country and through one of hundreds of NGOs taking a short-time position as a teacher at a school or university, the doors are wide open for anyone who shares my belief that the Tilahuns and Fangias of tomorrow deserve nothing less but the very best. And I hope that more teachers and students from the West will take the opportunity to spend some time at one of the universities there. Hopefully, it will foster a greater understanding for working conditions and social environments in which the local students and scientists live. As to paraphrase one famous guy who actually walked the moon, a small step is made by one teacher, but many teachers, a giant leap for mankind. And as exploration to the moon for those who dare to venture outside their comfort zones, it certainly will be an unforgettable experience. Thank you very much. <laughs>